Hello everyone, today's story is on Gary Thomas Allen, a man who was executed in Oklahoma for killing his 24-year-old girlfriend. Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Gary Thomas Allen was born on February 25, 1956. Growing up, Gary had a rough childhood and reports claim that his mother suffered from alcoholism and rejected him when he was young because of her addiction. Gary got into some trouble as a young boy and was eventually sent to the Bowley State School. Now if any of you look up the Bowley State School, you will see that it claims or claimed to be a training school for Negro boys, a juvenile facility in Oklahoma, and also an asylum. I'm going to read a small excerpt from the school's history. The John H. Lilly Correctional Center was originally built as a tuberculosis sanitarium for African Americans in 1923. In 1925, the facility became the state training school for Negro boys and housed black males who had previously been incarcerated at the boys' training school in McAllister. The institution was integrated in 1965 and the name was changed to Bowley State School for Boys. The Bowley State School for Boys was closed by legislative action in June of 1983. On July 1, 1983, the facility was established by the Oklahoma Department of Corrections. Back then, the school was known for misconduct and violence, definitely not rehabilitation. When Gary left the institution, mentally, he was screwed up. He decided not to return to school upon returning home and dropped out for good. Coming home was of no help because not only was his mom using, but all of his siblings were using drugs and drinking. Gary felt like what he was surrounded by was a normal everyday activity, so he joined in on his family's shenanigans. And even though Gary had dropped out of school, he was intelligent and had a fairly above average IQ. Still, his debilitating mood swings were frequent and he had tried to take his life six times as a teen. Despite having a hard upbringing, when he was of age, he decided to join the Navy. Unfortunately, he was still using drugs and drinking during this time, which made his mental health issues worse. He was reprimanded by the Navy and he was hospitalized or institutionalized for his mental illness. He was no longer suitable to be a Navy man and upon his release, Gary was admitted to the Oklahoma City Veterans Administration Hospital for psychological problems. One doctor said that Gary could not form and keep long-term relationships, he barely had any impulse control, and when he drank, it exacerbated his struggles. Despite having issues and being diagnosed with multiple things, Gary was able to find love. He married, but his first marriage did not last because his ex-wife said he had a horrible temper. Gary divorced his first wife and then married again, this time to a young pretty woman by the name of Lawana Gail Titsworth, aka Gail. In one court document, Gail was referred to as Gary's girlfriend, and in others, it states that she was his fiancée. Whatever the case may be, they were together and moved in together. In 1980, they had their firstborn son and named him Anthony. In 1984, they had their second son, Adrian. Fast forward to 1986. Gail had put up with a lot over the years. Their relationship was extremely rocky, and Gary was unable to kick his drug habit. Finally, Gail had enough. She could no longer take it and decided to move out of their shared home with their two sons. She moved out around November 17, 1986. Over the next few days, Gary was consistent in begging Gail to come back home to him. They argued, but Gail was adamant about not going back to live with Gary. Their little ones Anthony and Adrian were enrolled in a local daycare, so even though Gary did not know where Gail was staying, he knew where she would be every day, and that was the daycare to drop off their boys. On November 21st, 1986, Gary attempted once more to convince Gail to come back to him. An intoxicated Gary made his way to the Beulah's daycare center in Oklahoma City and walked up to Gail while she was inside of the daycare holding Adrian. Gail did not want to argue in front of the kids or the staff, so she walked into an empty room and it was there that they proceeded to argue. Gail then decided to grab her little ones and head towards her car in an attempt to leave. When she made it to her truck, she opened a door and Gary came up behind her and shut it. Gail opened it again, but Gary angrily shut it again. Some of the daycare employees were in the parking lot parked right next to Gail's truck. The fact of the matter is that they were in a parked van with children inside, so they were too scared to intervene. 
The two continued to argue and Gail was frustrated that Gary would not leave or leave her alone for that matter. Gary would not take no for an answer and realizing that Gail would probably never give in to his request, he pulled out a 38 caliber revolver from his sock and shot Gail two times in the chest. Gail fell but was still alive and pleading with Gary not to shoot her again. For a split second, something switched in Gary's twisted mind. He held Gail in his arms as if he was not the one who just assaulted her. He lifted up her blouse to check where her wounds were and began comforting her. After consoling and comforting her, he walked away from her and that is when one employee who was in the parked van next to her truck decided to help. She ran to Gail and assisted her in walking into the daycare for safety. They made it to the door and were seconds away from being able to shut the door behind them, but Gary looked back and noticed Gail was no longer lying on the floor. He ran to the front door of the center, pushed the employee inside, and knocked Gail down, but outside of the center on the front steps. A weakened Gail had no strength to fight back. Gary looked at Gail as she lay helplessly on the ground, and he shot her two more times in the back as she was trying to protect herself. Gary casually walked away and made his way to an alley nearby. He got spooked by the police that had just arrived at the scene, so he hid. I am going to read some of the trial transcripts about what happened next. As Officer Taylor was nearing the daycare center, a witness to the shooting directed him to an alley where Gary was apparently hiding. Officer Taylor spotted Gary as he drove into the alley. Officer Taylor drew his service revolver and ordered Gary to stop and remain still. Gary initially complied with Officer Taylor's order, but then began walking away. Officer Taylor followed Gary and reached out to place his hand on him. Gary quickly turned around and grabbed Officer Taylor's gun. A struggle ensued, during which Gary obtained partial control of Officer Taylor's gun. Gary attempted to make Officer Taylor shoot himself by applying pressure to Taylor's finger, which was still on the trigger. Ultimately, Officer Taylor regained control of the gun and shot Gary in the face. Gary was rushed to the hospital, where a CT scan revealed an air pocket in the front part of his brain and cerebral spinal fluid leaking from his nose and ear. Gary lost his left eye and part of his brain. Due to his injuries, Gary had to be hospitalized for a couple of months. Gary was indicted on murder charges, and when it was time for trial, he pled guilty to first-degree murder. Although entering a blind guilty plea, Gary's lawyers believed he should be spared from the death penalty because of past and current mental health issues and not being competent enough to stand trial. They did not even believe he was competent enough to enter the plea he did. From Gary's point of view, he felt that it was best for him to plead guilty because he wanted to spare the emotions of his friends and family and to the friends and family of Gail. He was quoted saying, I can't see making a bad matter worse. Bringing up problems we were having and what motivated me to do what I did, it just makes things worse than ever. Gary was sent to the Eastern State Hospital for about four months for treatment and to check whether or not he was competent to stand trial. After his stay at the hospital, the court was made aware of Gary's mental health issues, but he was still deemed to be competent to stand trial. When Gary was in court, the judge questioned him on his blind guilty plea and this is some of the questioning. What happened that caused you to think that there might be a problem? Did something happen on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, or Thursday? I really don't want... I don't want to talk about what problems we were having. I know that. There is just so many things I wanted to avoid by pleading guilty. Like what? Well, like for example, just discussing what I did. I did not want my family involved in this and I honestly thought when I pleaded guilty that that would be the end of this, that a sentence would just be passed. That was the impression I got. I had already taken my family through enough. I had already taken her family through enough and I had no desire to take them through more by going to trial and I had no idea things were going to come down to this where my family would be called on the stand and her family would be called up on the stand and everybody just has to go through more stuff. I just thought, you know, that if I committed the crime and admitted committing the crime, that that would end it for everybody because to stretch things out does nobody any good. I just don't see it as doing anyone any good. I just don't see it. I don't see anything constructive about discussing problems we were having. I just don't see it. What motivated us to go to church? I just failed to see any reason for even being asked that. At the conclusion of trial, Gary was found guilty and he was sentenced to death. After sentencing though, and all of the explanations of wanting to spare the emotions of family, Gary decided to withdraw his guilty plea on the grounds that there was insufficient evidence to support the death penalty. With the blind guilty plea, 
Gary did not know what his sentence would be, but since there was no deal with the prosecution, death was not off the table. But Gary was unaware that he could be sentenced to death. So with Gary's plea change, although the court could not withdraw his original plea, it did decide to remand his case for resentencing. Gary was hopeful that he would possibly be sentenced to life without parole, or at least that is what he wanted. When it was time for resentencing, Gary was given another opportunity to be heard. He was now saying that he could not remember the events of that day of the murder because he was intoxicated and was always self-medicating with narcotics. Again, this is some of the questioning that happened when Gary took to the stand. Now, before this event, before November the 21st of 1986, how often did you drink? Alcoholic beverages I'm talking about. How often did I drink? Uh-huh. I drank just about as often as I could. How much could you drink? I could drink as much as I could afford to get. Well, could you drink a fifth? Easily, if I could afford to get it, I'd always find some kind of way. I could drink just as much as I could. How often would you get drunk, say, in a week? I'd get drunk as many days in a week as I could. What's the last thing that you remember before 5 o'clock p.m. on November the 21st of 1986? I can remember drinking a lot, and I don't even know if it was on that day, but I was drinking just about every day at that point. Being intoxicated was not a valid reason to be sentenced to life without parole instead of death. He was first sentenced to death in December of 1987, and he was resentenced to death on October 22, 1993. Gary was originally set to be executed on May 19, 2005, but he was awarded a stay of execution after the prison reported that he had mental problems. While on death row, he was not taking his medication regularly, and his health was declining. The Oklahoma Pardon and Parole Board voted in April of 2005 that Gary's death sentence should be vacated and he should be given life without parole. Gary was excited that finally he was able to escape the death penalty. Life without parole is what he wanted all along. Gary's excitement soon faded away because the parole board did not have the final say. Governor Mary Fallon denied the parole board's decision and Gary was rescheduled to die on November 6, 2012. Before Gary's execution, he was granted a last meal. He ate a large meat lover's pizza all by himself, and he was also able to enjoy a Pepsi to go along with it. Gary's execution began at 5.58 p.m. Gary was strapped in the gurney, and he was able to see the witnesses in the viewing room. He saw his attorneys, waved, and said hi. Even before the drugs were administered, Gary began rambling, and some things did not even make sense. He talked about Obama and Mitt Romney. While he was going on about the two candidates, other inmates on Oklahoma's death row began banging on their cell bars and walls, sending Gary off and giving their final goodbyes. Gary went on to say, Obama won two out of three counties. It's going to be a very close race. He was allowed to continue for a bit before the warden officially asked Gary, do you have any final words? He had already been talking, so Gary was confused and replied with a, huh? He ignored the question and continued talking. In the middle of his rambling, he raised his head up again. He saw his attorneys and said, Hi. Who knows if it was a lapse of memory due to his brain injury or because of his declining mental health, but he did not realize that he had already spotted his attorneys and greeted them. He continued speaking unintelligible words, and then he said, I hope that more realize Jesus is the Son of God, the only Son of God. Jesus is the one and only Savior. Gary continued on. Now remember he ignored the warden's question about if he had any last words. Well, the warden had started a two minute timer because Gary had continued talking and the warden let Gary know that his two minutes were almost up. Gary then looked at the warden and said, what? Gary was still confused. He continued rambling on though while his attorneys got emotional and started crying. They believed in their hearts that a mentally unhealthy man was being executed and they did not think it was right. At 6.02 p.m., the warden said, let the execution begin. Gary replied, huh? Gary was still confused about what was happening. He looked around the room, observed the witness area, and for the third time, he locked eyes on his attorneys and said hi to them. His attorneys waved back at him. Gary continued rambling until the effects of a lethal injection kicked in. He went from talking and rambling to making loud noises and grunting. Gary was pronounced dead at 6.10 p.m. Attorney General Scott Pruitt went on record and said, Gary Allen was sentenced to death for senselessly ending the life of his fiancée and the mother of his two children. 
After numerous lost appeals and delayed justice, my thoughts are with Gail Titsworth's family, especially her two sons who were left without a mother due to Gary Allen's actions. The victim's family then came out with a statement. Our beloved Gail, daughter, sister, and mother of two young boys, was taken from our family tragically and senselessly due to DV. For over 25 years, we have waited for justice to be served and for this sentence to be carried out. We are thankful to close the book on this chapter today, but we will never stop grieving the loss of Gail, and one we have endured for far too long. Gail's memory will continue to live on through the lives of her now grown sons and her grandchildren. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. Let me know what you guys think of this story in the comments below. Previously on Death Row Executions, I told the story of John Jacobson Jr., aka Skylar de Leon, someone who was guilty of killing three people and was sentenced to death for it. If you missed it, click this video to check it out.